Happening now in Ottawa, Government of Canada officials outlined the latest COVID-19 modelling projections. This marks the first government modelling since Canada started recording new variants of the virus. Let's listen. 148,000 to over 837,000 cases today. The rate of increase has slowed over the past several weeks. At the same time, COVID-19 virus variants of concern have emerged and now appear in 10 provinces. To date, there are over 660 B117 variants, 39 B1351 variants, and one P1 variant, and five provinces are reporting evidence of community spread and outbreak activity associated with these fast-spreading variants. Good morning, everyone. Today, we will talk about the national efforts in epidemiology and modeling that have uh, formed our current management of COVID-19. There are currently fewer than uh, 33,000 active cases in Canada, which is almost 60% fewer active cases than one month ago. Although the total number of cumulative cases has increased by over 148,000 to over 837,000 cases today, the rate of increase has slowed over the past several weeks. At the same time, COVID-19 various virus variants of concern have emerged and now appear in 10 provinces. To date, there are over 660 B117 variants. 39 B1351 variants and one P1 variant. Five provinces are reporting evidence of community spread and outbreak activity associated with these faster spreading variants. To slide one, our daily case counts have been steadily declining over several weeks. But at the current national average of 2,900 new cases reported daily, case counts are still 60% higher than the peak of the first wave. With the emergence and spread of new variants of concern, we are cautioned that unless we maintain and abide by stringent public health measures, we may not be able to avert a reacceleration of the epidemic in Canada. Dear positive, uh, Slide one. Daily case counts have been steadily declining over several weeks. But at the current national average of about 2,900 new cases reported daily, case counts are still 60% higher than the peak of the first wave. With the emergence and spread of new variants of concern, we are cautioned that unless we maintain and abide by stringent public health measures, we may not be able to avert a reacceleration of the epidemic in Canada. Slide two, ongoing steady declines in COVID-19 activity has been seen in most provinces in Canada, including the most populous and heavily impacted provinces west of the Atlantic region. However, the rapid escalation of cases associated with the B117 variant in the eastern health region of Newfoundland and Labrador demonstrates how quickly the situation can change when you have highly contagious variants uh, being introduced. Rapid, decisive public health response by the province is what is needed to stop a variant of concern in its tracks. Renewed activity has also been reported in Nunavut. However, there is no indication of new variants of concern in the territories to date. To maintain our progress in controlling COVID-19 and to prevent further accelerations, we need to keep the pressure on the virus, applying what works with even more diligence. Early strong and sustained community-based public health measures and consistent adherence to individual practices work best to slow growth, maintain low act levels of activity, or eliminate transmission from an area. We still have a ways to go to see the widespread and sustained decline in disease activity and management of rapidly spreading variants that we need to be confident we can bring the pandemic under strong control nationally. Dear positive, dear. Slide two. Ongoing steady declines in COVID-19 activity has been seen in most provinces in Canada, including the most populous and heavily impacted provinces west of the Atlantic region. However, the rapid escalation of cases associated with the B117 variant in the Eastern Health region of Newfoundland and Labrador 
demonstrates how quickly the situation can change when highly contagious variants are introduced. Rapid, decisive public health response by the province is what is needed to stop a variant of concern in its tracks. Renewed activity has also been reported in none of it. However, there is no indication of new variants of concern in the territories to date. To maintain our progress in controlling COVID-19 and to prevent further acceleration of variants of concern, we need to keep the pressure on the virus, applying what works with even more diligence. Early, strong and sustained community-based public health measures and consistent adherence to individual practices work best to slow growth, maintain low levels of activity, or eliminate transmission from an area. We still have a ways to go to see the widespread and sustained decline in disease activity and management of rapidly spreading variants that we need to be confident we can bring the pandemic under strong control nationally. Slide three. Since the last modeling update, the number of health regions reporting over 100 cases per 100,000 population, dark blue areas, has decreased from 59 to 35, as community-based measures have worked to reduce spread. Some Atlantic provinces have been able to sustain sufficient measures to manage importations, interrupt spread, and maintain strong control of COVID-19. However, as noted, Newfoundland and Labrador reported a recent surge in cases due to um, the introduction of the B117 virus variant. Renewed activity has also been reported in Nunavut, and all cases today are located in the Arviat uh, area, and strong measures are being taken to prevent further spread. Yeah, positive. Slide three. <laughs> Since the last modeling update, the number of health regions reporting over 100 cases per 1,000 population, these are the dark blue areas, has decreased from 59 to 35, as community-based measures have worked to reduce spread. Some Atlantic provinces have been able to, to sustain sufficient measures to maintain importations, manage rather importations, interrupt spread, and maintain strong control, control of COVID-19. However, as noted, Newfoundland and Labrador reported a recent surge in cases due to community spread and outbreaks associated with the introduction of the B117 virus variant. Renewed activity has also been reported in Nunavut. To date, all cases are located in Arviat, and strong measures are being taken to prevent further spread. Slide 4. In alignment with the overall decline in disease activity, infection rates have been steadily declining across all age groups for several weeks, and the incidence remains highest among persons 80 years and older, who are at high risk for severe outcomes including death. Dear positive cat. Slide four. In alignment with the overall decline in de disease activity, infection rates have been steadily declining across all age groups for several weeks. Incidence remains highest among persons 80 years and older who are at high risk for severe outcomes, including death. Slide five. Ongoing high rates of infection in communities continues to be a risk for new infections, more and larger outbreaks, and introduction into high-risk populations, such as hospitals, long-term care homes, and other close and close living setting, where spread can be further amplified. Although the number of outbreaks in long-term care settings appears to have declined in January, the introduction of more easily transmitted variants into these and other settings is a concern. In recent weeks, outbreaks involving variants of concern have been reported in a range of settings from long-term care homes, hospitals and schools to apartment buildings, a workplace and other community settings. Bringing infection rates and preventing the spread of highly contagious variants requires individual and public health authorities working together even more diligently as these new variants provide far less margin for gaps and errors. Dear positive. Slide five, 
Ongoing high rates of infection in communities continues to be a risk for new infections, more and larger outbreaks, and introductions into high-risk populations and settings, such as hospitals, long-term care homes, and other closed and close living settings where spread can be further amplified. Although the number of outbreaks in long-term care settings appears to have declined in January, the introduction of more easily transmitted variants into these and other settings is a growing concern. In recent weeks, outbreaks involving variants of concern have been reported in a range of settings, from long-term care homes, hospitals and schools, to apartment buildings, a workplace, and other community settings. Bringing infection rates and preventing the spread of highly contagious variants requires individual and public health authorities working together even more diligently as these new variants provide far less margin for gaps and errors. Slide six. Indigenous populations are at a high risk for rapid spread of COVID-19 and potentially more severe outcomes, given an increased likelihood to live in multi-generational homes and in remote communities with reduced access to health and critical services. For example, unlike in the earlier stages of the pandemic, when many First Nations communities have been successful in their efforts to stop the spread, the rate of new COVID-19 cases in First Nations on reserve populations exceeds that of the general Canadian population. In general, First Nations communities have higher attack and mortality rates when compared to the overall Canadian population. Infection rates remain high in many First Nations communities and reintroduction and spread of COVID-19 including variants of concern, is an ongoing concern for all Indigenous communities. Another example, although case counts have remained low across the territories, a recent surge of cases has been reported in Nunavut. All cases to date have been located in Arviat, and in response, health authorities have tightened restrictions in Arviat, including restricting travel to and from the community. Yeah, positive, sis. Slide six. Indigenous populations are at high risk for rapid spread of COVID-19 and potentially more severe outcomes, given an increased likelihood to live in multi-generational homes and in remote communities with reduced access to health and critical care services. For example, Unlike earlier stages of the pandemic, when many First Nations communities had been successful in their efforts to stop the spread, the rate of new COVID-19 cases in First Nations on reserve populations exceeds that of the general Canadian population. In general, First Nations communities have higher attack and mortality rates when adjusted for population structure differences when compared to the overall Canadian population. Infection rates remain high in many First Nations communities and reintroduction and spread of COVID-19, including variants of concern. And this is an ongoing concern for all Indigenous communities. As another example, although case counts have remained low across the territories, a recent surge of cases has been reported in Nunavut. All cases to date have been located in Arviat, and in response, health authorities have tightened restrictions in Arviat, including restricting travel to and from the community. Slide seven. Hospitalization rates have been declining across most provinces since late January. Over the past week, an average of 2,420 people with COVID-19 were being treated in hospitals on any given day, including 570 of whom were in critical care. On average, the length of stay for people hospitalized is about 16 days, or about 20 days for those experiencing more severe illness. The decline in severe outcomes is relieving some of the strain on the health system, though backlogs and an exhausted health workforce remain in many areas of the country. Dear positive set. Slide seven. 
Hospitalization rates have been declining across most provinces since late January. Over the last week, an average of 2,420 people with COVID-19 were being treated in Canadian hospitals on any given day, including 570 of whom were in critical care. On average, the length of stay for people hospitalized is about 16 days or about 20 days for those experiencing more severe illness. The decline in serious outcomes is relieving some of the strain on the health system, although backlogs and an exhausted health workforce remain in many areas of the country. Slide 8. Since the previous update in mid-January, the average number of daily deaths has decreased by close to 58% following the decline in infection rates across the country. Over the past seven days, there have been an average of 59 deaths reported daily. Those aged 80 years or over account for 70% of all deaths, and those aged 60 to 79 years accounting for 26%. A majority of deaths continue to be linked to outbreaks in long-term care homes. People of any age can experience severe or prolonged illness due to COVID-19. To date, 96 deaths have been reported in adults 20 to 39 years of age. The positive. Slide eight. Since the previous update in mid-January, the average number of daily deaths has decreased by close to 58% following the decline in infection rates across the country. Over the past seven days, there have been an average of 59 deaths reported daily. Those aged 80 years and over account for 70% of all deaths, and those aged 60 to 79 years of age account for 26%. A majority of deaths continue to be linked to outbreaks in long-term care homes. People of any age can experience serious or prolonged illness due to COVID-19. To date, 96 deaths have been reported in adults 20 to 39 years of age. Slide 9. Based on Canadian data up to February the 13th, Short-term forecasting shows the predicted cases and deaths due to COVID-19 out to February the 28th. The graph on the left shows the predicted number of cases could be in the range of 841,650 to 878,850 by February the 28th. The graph on the right shows the predicted number of deaths could be in range of 21,510 to 22,420 uh, during that same period. The positive near. Slide nine. Based on Canadian data up to February 13th, short-term forecasting shows the predicted cases and deaths due to COVID-19 out to February 28th. The graph on the left shows the predicted number of cases could be in the range of 841,650 to 878,850 by February 28th. The graph on the right shows the predicted number of deaths could be in the range of 21,510 to 22,420 by February 28th. On slide 10, this longer range forecast, which we've been using over the past many months, is based on only on non-variant COVID-19 virus spread and shows how the epidemic could evolve over the next two months without variants of concern. Given the progress we have made in reducing COVID-19 activity across Canada, this model forecasts that Canada could have an average of 2,500 cases daily by the end of February. As always, this outcome assumes that consistent, strong and combined efforts of individual Canadians and local public health authorities continue. However, the parameters of this model are becoming less useful due to the emergence of variants of concern that have an enhanced ability to infect and spread faster among the population, which this model does not account for. Dear positive. Slide 10. This longer range forecast, which we have been using over the past many months, 
is based only on non-variant COVID-19 virus spread and shows how the epidemic could evolve over the next two months without variants of concern. Given the progress we have made in reducing COVID-19 activity across Canada, this model forecasts that Canada could have an average 2,500 cases daily by the end of February. As always, this outcome assumes the constant, consistent, strong and combined efforts of individual Canadians and local public health authorities continue. However, the parameters of this model are becoming less useful due to the emergence of variants of concern that have an enhanced ability to infect and spread faster among the population, which this model does not account for. Slide 11. Although it is normal for variants to emerge as viruses continue continuously evolve, some variants are considered variants of concern because they spread more easily or cause more severe illness or because current vaccines may be less effective against them. In the past two months, more contagious virus variants first found in the UK, South Africa and Brazil have emerged in Canada and have now appeared in all provinces. Starting with a few travel-related cases in the early weeks, these variants have been smoldering in the background and now threaten to flare up. Yeah, positive. Slide 11. Although it is normal for variants to emerge as viruses continuously evolve, some variants are considered variants of concern because they spread more easily or cause more severe illness or because current vaccines may be less effective against them. In the past two months, more contagious virus variants, first found in the UK, South Africa and Brazil, have emerged in Canada and now have appeared in all 10 provinces. Starting with a few travel-related cases in the early weeks, these variants have now been smoldering in the background and now threaten to flare up into a rapid blaze. Slide 12. A new longer range forecast model that accounts for the transmission dynamics of both non-variant and new variants of concern is giving us insight into what could happen if more contagious variants continue to spread in Canada. So this model predicts that with more contagious variants spreading, further lifting of the public health measures will cause the epidemic to resurge rapidly and strongly. That's the orange line. And current community-based public health measures will be insufficient to control rapid growth and resurgence is forecast, the gray line. But if a com combination of enhanced community-based public health measures and good adherence to individual precautions are implemented and sustained, the epidemic is forecast to come under control. Adhering to individual precautions means that we all must maintain physical distancing, reduce contacts outside of our household to just essential activities, continue with good hand washing practices and wearing a well-constructed, well-fitted and properly worn face mask to protect ourselves and others. For local authorities, this means maintaining or immediately implementing strong public health measures, which may include restrictions, closures, and other community-based control measures to achieve the reductions in contacts necessary to get ahead of or prevent further spread of rapidly spreading variants. We've been saying all along that if we ease measures too soon, the epidemic will resurge even stronger. But with highly contagious variants in our midst, the threat of uncontrolled epidemic growth is significantly elevated. This is why measures must be stronger, stricter, and sustained long enough to suppress rapid epidemic growth of various variants of concern. Dear positive, do. Slide 12. A new longer range forecast model that accounts for transmission dynamics of both non variant COVID 19 and new variants of concern is giving us insight into what could happen if more contagious variants continue to spread in Canada. With more contagious variants spreading, this model predicts that further lifting of public health measures 
will cause the epidemic to resurge rapidly and strongly. This is the orange line. And current community-based public health measures will be insufficient to control rapid growth and resurgence is forecast. That is the gray line. But if a combination of enhanced community-based public health measures and good adherence to individual precautions are implemented and sustained, the epidemic is forecast to come under control. This is the blue line. Adhering to individual precautions means that we must all maintain physical distancing, reduced contacts outside of our household to just essential activities, continue with good hand-washing practices, and wear a well-constructed, well-fitting, and properly worn face mask to protect ourselves and others. For local authorities, this means maintaining or immediately implementing strong public health measures, which may include restrictions, closures, and other community-based control measures to achieve the reductions in contacts necessary to get ahead of or prevent further spread of a rapidly spreading variants. We've been saying all along that if we ease measures too soon, the epidemic will resurge even stronger. But with highly contagious variants in our midst, the threat of uncontrolled epidemic growth is significantly elevated. This is why measures must be stronger, stricter, and sustained long enough to suppress rapid epidemic growth of variants of concern. Slide 13. The experiences of other countries demonstrate that we can control the spread of COVID-19 even when more contagious variants are predominating. The United Kingdom saw a very rapid increase in cases associated with the emergence and spread of B117 variant in early December, when their public health measures were less stringent. They have since achieved a steady decline in infection rates with implementation of strong and sustained public health measures to preserve critical care capacity and enhance border measures to prevent further virus introduction and spread. Israel also experienced a large surge in cases starting in early December when public health measures were less stringent. Although adult vaccinations began in mid to late December, strengthened and sustained public health measures have been necessary to suppress rapid growth as the vaccine coverage increases. With the detection of B117 variant in late December, now accounting for a large majority of new cases and the emergence of B1351 in late January, Israel has enhanced border measures to interrupt further introductions while continuing rigorous testing, genomic sequencing, and tracing to stop slow the spread of new variants of concern. Yeah, positive. Slide 13. The experiences of other countries demonstrate that we can control the spread of COVID-19 even when more contagious variants are predominating. The UK saw a very rapid increase of cases associated with the emergence and spread of the B117 variant in early December when their public health measures were less stringent. They have since achieved a steady decline in infection rates with implementation of strong and sustained public health measures to preserve critical care capacity and thanks to enhanced border measures to prevent further virus introduction and spread. Israel also experienced a large surge in cases starting in early December when public health measures were also less stringent. Although adult vaccination began in mid to late December, strengthened and sustained public health measures have been necessary to suppress rapid growth as vaccine coverage increases. With the detection of the B11 variant in late 117 in late December, now accounting for a large majority of cases, and the emergence of the B1351 variant in late January, Israel has enhanced border measures to interrupt further introductions while continuing vigorous testing, genomic sequencing, and tracing to slow the spread of new variants of concern. Slide 14. 
We are at a critical point in the pandemic and our efforts have begun to tip the balance in our favor with overall disease activity declining and initial vaccine programs on the way. At the same time, variants of concern have emerged and are spreading across Canada, threatening our progress. Evidence is also emerging that some variants of concern, including the B117 variant, are associated with, with a higher risk of severe outcomes, including hospitalization and death. But we have solutions. This virus has shown time and again that what works best is a united front, quick action, and a sustained effort. Protecting our progress and limiting the impact of variants of concern will require stronger action through a combination of enhanced public health measures and strict adherence to individual precautions. For individual Canadians, this means following public health advice and doing our personal best by aiming to have the fewest interactions with the fewest people for the shortest time at the greatest distance possible while wearing the best fitting face mask. The path of COVID-19 may not be easy, but we are stronger. We can do this, so let's do it together. Thank you. Yeah, but, yeah, but. Slide 14. We are at a critical point in the pandemic. Our efforts have begun to tip the balance in our favor, with overall disease activity declining and initial vaccine programs underway. At the same time, variants of concern have emerged and are spreading across Canada, threatening our progress. Evidence is also emerging that some variants of concern, including the B117 variant, are associated with a higher risk of severe outcomes, including hospitalization and death. But we are not without solutions. This virus has shown time and again that what works is a united front, quick action, and sustained effort. Protecting our progress and limiting the impact of variants of concern will require stronger action through a combination of enhanced public health measures and strict adherence to individual precautions. For individual Canadians, this means following public health advice and doing our personal best by aiming to have the fewest interactions with the fewest people for the shortest time at the greatest distance possible while wearing the best fitting face mask. The path of COVID-19 may not be easy, but we are stronger. We can do this. Let's do it together. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Nous allons maintenant passer à la période de, de questions au téléphone. We'll move to the question and answer uh, portion of the briefing. Uh, as usual, you get one question and one follow-up. Vous, vous pouvez poser votre question et votre question de suivi dans l'une ou l'autre des langues officielles. Opérateur, à vous la parole. Thank you. Merci. Our first question, notre première question, Marie Vastel, Le Devoir. Please go ahead, à vous la parole. Uh, oui, bonjour. Good day. Either of you can respond. I'd like to come back to slide 12 with the graph and the curve if we include the variance of concern. Could you just give us some more specific figures with regard to the forecast? I see the orange line, the gray line show as well as are increasing strongly, blue is going down. But could you talk about the number of cases we could reach by a certain date with the orange, gray, and blue lines? Merci, c'est Dr. New. Thank you, this is Dr. New, if I may begin. I think that the graph is to show in general what could occur in the future if we do not continue with public health with strict public health measures. It's not really a matter of exact figures. Perhaps we can, with our experts in modeling, give you afterwards some exact figures or more exact figures, but it's the same situation. We always say it's not a crystal ball with modeling. We cannot really give an exact date with exact figures, but we can consult our experts and perhaps 
we can provide greater details as available. Dr. Hem, I don't know if you have anything you wish to add. No, Pavel Ramomis. Not really. If we uh, slow our efforts, There will be a rapid increase in the number of cases for this model we assumed that the variance of concern are 50 percent more transmissible so we can add or create a number of scenarios but this is one of the possibilities Yes, if you could come back with the figures, because and I imagine that uh, you don't want to make mistakes and guess at what time we'll have 20,000 cases, but it would be good to have more details. But with regard to the measures that we mustn't stop, what would you like to see? Do you have specific suggestions for the provinces? Continue having a curfew like in Quebec, shut down businesses like in Ontario. Do you have any specific suggestions as to what should be done other than we must continue? So Dr. New, this is Dr. New. I'll start if I may. I think that if we want to lift the public health measures, then we must do so with a great deal of caution and not too early or too quickly. We need to have a good monitoring system in order to screen, trace, and quarantine all cases because if there are indications that the infection rate it, such as the death rate or the hospitalization rate to arise, this will occur after, too, too late. So we have to be aware of other signs that the uh, infection rate is increasing. So if we also see that the number of cases or the proportion of cases caused by variants is also increasing, this is a sign, in my opinion, for authorities to perhaps strengthen and put in place the restrictions Thank you. Merci. Our next question, notre prochaine question, de Marika Walsh with the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Ouvre la parole. Hi. Thank you so much for taking our questions. Dr. Tam, I'm wondering if you can give a bit more clarity on the variants. Is it accurate to say that these models show the variants will replace, uh, I guess, the original COVID? Variant in Canada in the next two months. It, will it be? Will the variants become the dominant strains of COVID in Canada? Well, as, as um, I indicated, viruses will undergo evolution as they spread. So the more spread there is, the more abilities for this virus to con continue to mutate. And so, um, and there are different variants. So there is an international effort, of course, now to try and classify these variants and determine which ones are the ones that we need to pay most attention uh, for. The models themselves are only trying to illustrate what would happen if you have a variant of increased transmissibility. So that's the, the, what the, the slide 12 uh, is trying to show. It doesn't demonstrate, of course, the other impacts, such as is it causing more severe illness, et cetera. And that does not illustrate necessarily um, whether a variant will replace or not um, what's uh, the uh, preceding um, viruses that are going on. I think that the trajectory could be different for the three variants that we're tracking right now. The B117 variant, for example, uh, has been seen in numerous countries. So I think last time I saw was over 85. So you can see that this variant is becoming much more common. 
whether in different areas of the world it would then become the predominant uh, virus remains to be seen, but it, it has been the predominant virus now in uh, a number of European countries, for example. So this is one variant where we might expect it to become the new uh, sort of circulating um, virus. Um, the other ones remains to be seen. We, we're not seeing that many cases of those. There's still quite a number of countries reporting them, but they are fewer in number. So it's possible that they will um, disappear one day or they will replace um, the current circulating strain. So, but the B117 variant for sure is the one that appears to uh, becoming very common. And you've seen some of the data, I think, coming out of Ontario um, showing that, you know, um, it could be around seven, eight percent of the, uh, um, the, the, the um, I guess, samples that, that the positive samples that they've screened. And so that is showing us that right now is not that prevalent. Could it become more prevalent? That is a possibility for sure. Yeah, it's Dr. Okay, maybe and I just uh, uh, add a few points to, to Dr. Tan. I think, you know, whether the variants become, a, as you say, more predominant in Canada, I think at the end of the day, it all depends on us as Canadians. You know, uh, you know, as, as uh, Dr. Tam stated, the, the virus normally naturally continues to evolve and, and maybe uh, have, have a mutation. So the less that we, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, sorry, have contacts with each other and, and limit the, the, the spread of, of the virus here in Canada, that would also limit the ability of the virus to continue to, you know, obviously uh, uh, mutate and so on by having more hosts to, to infect. The other point I think that's important to stress is, as we've said all along, Canadians should not be uh, traveling uh, abroad for non-essential reasons. Uh, as you can see, uh, if you go abroad, not only might you be at risk of uh, uh, getting uh, COVID-19, but you might be picking up a variant, uh, emerging variant in another country and bringing that back to Canada. So I think uh, those two points need to be underlined as well. Thank you. Thanks for that. I just so I understand that this is not a crystal ball, but can you be any more clear, at least in terms of how likely this is? You're saying that it's not a guarantee that we are going to see. I, I guess if you're saying that the variants might not become predominant in Canada, then we wouldn't see these really big numbers that are spelled out on slide 12. So. How likely are you saying that slide 12 is? Like, is slide 12 the new baseline, I guess, is the question, or is this just the worst case scenario? Well, I think um, given um, what we've seen in other countries and the fact that the B117 variant, for example, which uh, appears to be more transmissible, um, is already in Canada. I think that um, slide 12, as you put it, um, is a, a current reality. And so if you want to look at it as the new baseline, you, you can. Um, the preceding slide that shows what we could do if we continued our efforts uh, is still possible. Um, so that's the one that is discounting the uh, entry of the variants. But I, I, I think from, from my, my own perspective, we got the variants in Canada, particularly the B117. That one is looking like it, it, it could be difficult to uh, contain, as it were, so that uh, if we let go of some of these measures and you don't do it slowly, thoughtfully, bringing the population along with continuing some of their personal protective practices, you're going to see uh, a re resurgence. Because for a number of reasons, the population immunity is probably still quite low in Canada. We've got these zero surveys, very few um, of the population immune. Our vaccine programs are, are beginning to escalate, but they haven't got to a, a, a point where um, enough people are protected. And then you look at a place like Israel or the United Kingdom. They've been vaccinating more people than, um, than other areas and they still had to put in the public health measures to slow down the virus while their vaccine uh, program is escalated, which is why I think in the next couple of months, while well, this model could go further, um, this is a, a, a potential a scenario to, that we have to be absolutely aware of. 
Um, so I think, I don't know if that answers your question, but really the message is that if we let go, we got to do it really carefully. And for the most part, try to keep up with what you have now. Um, but this rapid um, response is needed if you, if you suddenly see an increase in cases and tests and, and sequence and look for those variants. Thank you. Uh, next question. Thank you. Merci. Our next question, the prochaine question, Mackenzie Gray with CTV News. Please go ahead. Have la parole. Uh, hi, my first question is for Dr. Tam. Uh, Dr. Tam, throughout the slides and in, in your uh, remarks today, you've said that we need stronger action taken. Yet many provinces across the country are easing restrictions right now. Uh, have you raised the need to have stronger restrictions at this point with your provincial colleagues? Because it does not seem like the provinces are listening to what you're saying. Well, of course, we are in uh, constant communication with uh, chief medical officers. And they, again, as usual, um, in this big country of ours, each of them are experiencing things in a slightly different way and have different contexts. But I think they are all... Uh, vigilant and know that if you ease anything at all, it better be slow with a lot of uh, surveillance, testing, and that there needs to be a commitment to rapidly respond if things escalate. And I, I do think that given um, all the things I've just said, uh, a resurgence is very likely if people let go uh, of the public health measures right now. Uh, but what you want to do is to keep avoiding, I think, this yo-yoing effect of up and down. And uh, you need to avoid um, complete lockdowns and curfews and all of those things by trying to maintain um, a strong level of public health measures. And so, you know, I, I, I don't think any of the population or businesses or others just want to see, you know, us keep, you know, provinces keep um, sort of going up and down with their measures. Um, I think I think the initial really careful easing. Why would you ease your measures? Well, only if you got the sequencing in place, you got your testing to a good level. You know that when you find a case, you can detect the context. If those things are not well in place, one shouldn't be easing those measures. Uh, you can't just keep doing the same thing and expect a different result, right? So you have to uh, have enforced those other public health capacities uh, in order to be able to cope with any uh, signs of uh, uptick. Uh, I'd like to know uh, in the modeling how much you have factored in an increase in the ability for Canadians to get vaccinated in terms of the number of cases and the number of deaths. And can you give us a number of how many Canadians will need to be vaccinated for there to be a meaningful decrease in either cases or deaths? So right now, we, um, I think the, the supply projections are uh, posted and to a certain extent. So we are still in a period where um, the supply of vaccines is just escalating. So for the next months, we're not going to have a lot of people vaccinated. So that's, that's a fact, right? So, so then, um, in, in terms of seeing a decrease in hospitalization and death, that is possible because we are now, um, it, throughout Canada, uh, trying to provide vaccine to the priority groups, including long-term care homes and seniors and those at high risk of exposure, such as the healthcare workers who look after them in the long-term care homes. You would have seen some um, sort of media sound bites on some of the results that provinces are seeing, including British Columbia and Quebec. Even with one dose of vaccines, they're seeing a vac high vaccine effectiveness. And I've heard, uh, we will, by the end of this month, calculate how many long-term care outbreaks in February, because February is only sort of halfway through. But you can see from that graph included in the slides that you're going to see a trend down and the number of uh, persons in the, uh, 
linked to those outbreaks decrease. And given that such a significant proportion of severe outcomes and deaths are linked to those high-risk populations, we will, I think, see that impact um, quite soon. And we're seeing some of that now. We need to see the sort of publication of the results. Uh, but that is actually a really good news. People need to remember that. But we need to keep going on the vaccine. And in order for the vaccine to have the best runway it can to take off, you need to get make sure those cases are kept low. And it'll be many uh, a while before you can even uh, you know get to a certain percentage of the population uh, getting vaccinated. And each time you're focusing on um, a, a slightly different group. The, the reason we showed also the international slides is that we will always look towards uh, other countries uh, for lessons learned. And um, for, for Israel, for example, that's uh, undergone a, a, a lot of vaccination in their uh, communities. Um, they've got a combination of public health measures and the vaccines going at the same time. Uh, but we do know that based on the data, the vaccines work very well. And so that combination um, of uh, measures has enabled the, uh, that country to see this curve go down. Um, so we'll, we'll be able to sort of judge uh, a bit more. And the, model, the modelers will take into account these new parameters as they learn about them. Um, and the models can be adjusted over time as well. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Merci. Our next question, notre prochaine question, from Catherine Lévesque avec la Presse canadienne. Please go ahead, à vous la parole. Oui, bonjour. Good morning. I would like to come back to the numbers with regard to the curve on page 16 in the appendix. I know that you say that you don't have the figures, but the orange curve is very concerning. Do you have an estimate or an idea of the average number of cases that we might have in March 1st or April 1st with that orange curve? And if you also have figures for the gray line, that would be good too. Uh, so Dr. New. Dr. New here. Don't have the exact figures. We can, of course, provide you perhaps later figures from our experts at the agency because they provided they they provided the graphs and they have more specific data perhaps that's the best way to get an estimate because i'm not able to provide that dr tem perhaps you may have something to add um uh, um not really It's to illustrate the curve the curves of the relating to the different scenarios. There's a very different uh, situation in the provinces. So for example, if you looked at any number of those provinces, what they do now is they don't let go of anything and the varying comes in, this might happen. Um, so, but if there are no variants that, uh, detected, that, that, that trajectory would remain more like the current state. Um, and, um, but, you know, they, they are, it's, it's to illustrate that if the variants do come in, I think uh, from one of our previous questions, if the variants do come into a province and they lift their public health measures, that is not what you need to see. If you see a variant come in and you, you need to increase your measures in order to get it under control. So that's uh, pretty much an illustration, again, with the assumption of a variant as 50% more transmissible, um, which is a sort of ballpark as well. Uh, so you can't be absolutely certain about that kind of thing. But, you know, just uh, uh, for, for illustration, you know, it, right now we're only seeing um, in, under 3,000 ca cases a day right now. Um, a variant that comes in 50% more transmissible and you release your measures, you're looking at thousands more uh, a day. And uh, remember, we were at over 8,000 cases a day at the beginning of January. And they could be more than that. That, that third 
sort of resurgence. Could that third um, curve going up can be way more than 8,500 cases a day is what um, this model is trying to demonstrate. And just to illustrate the point, but we don't have the exact figures. With respect, this is a technical briefing, so we would have expected to have more details. What you were saying, Dr. Tam, I, I was just wondering, I know that the situation is, will be different in every province, but let's say in the cases of Ontario or Quebec, for example, right now, those two provinces are easing their restrictions. Considering there are variants in those two provinces, are we in the current state going on, on the, the gray line or are we going towards the orange line It's in those two provinces? Um, I think, again, you know, you're going to see the impact of these measures within that sort of two week or so time frame. And this is the so the issue with this virus is that you, you release your measures now, you're going to see what happens in a couple of weeks. And um, so you can't quite tell where that trajectory is at the moment. Um, but, um, you know, if there's not enough capacity to do enough testing, tracing and sequencing, then, you know, th there's a distinct possibility that the gray line will veer towards the orange line. How much it veers towards the orange line remains to be seen. But we do know that in Ontario, for example, the B117 variant has been detected in multiple health units and has already caused some outbreaks. So at the same time, if you want to reduce the impact, you need to make sure all those long-term care facilities um, and, and residents and seniors are, are vaccinated. And so these layers of measures need to be in place. But I, I do think that from, from the chief medical officers, they, they do recognize that you can't just release the brakes entirely. You're going to have to do it really carefully. Some of our recommendations have been do it very small. Um, most provinces are going to focus on can we get kids back to school? So that's one setting. Look at what happens to that for like three weeks. Don't sort of keep adding on the easing of measures. Give it enough time to see what actually happens in order to inform whether you need to tighten or uh, whether you need you can um, continue on the uh, current state. Um, but um, so so that's that's really critical. And um, if you release your measures without increasing the capacity to manage cases and contacts, then resurgence will occur. Okay, we're running out of time. We have time for one quick last question. Operator. Thank you, merci. Our next question, notre prochaine question, David Thurton from CBC News. Please go ahead, have la parole. Hi. Um, Doctors, I'm just wondering if you can tell us anything about this new study that shows that the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, just one shot of this vaccine, packs quite a bit of a punch. Uh, what does this mean for your guidance on the administering of maybe just one dose in future? That is a really great question. And I, I think um, it's great to end on that question, actually, because... We can be very optimistic, I think, about the performance of the um, mRNA vaccines, I think. There are studies now beginning to emerge, um, both abroad and in Canada, that just that initial dose um, packs quite a punch, as you said. Some new data, uh, for example, from Quebec and from British Columbia, but also reported uh, as a roundtable, if you like, by other jurisdictions. Uh, shows that after one dose um, and um, after the people who are vaccinated, um, you know, two to three weeks later, you see a very high vaccine uh, effectiveness um, and, and, and certainly over 80 percent. And why that's good news, one is that in the clinical trials, um, many of the participants are not um, you know, uh, uh, some of the healthier participants, if you like. 
what we've now uh, demonstrated is that the vaccine is highly effective in the uh, most senior of our populations who have um, a fragile health uh, status, like those in long-term care, in a congregate living setting. So that's a real-life demonstration of just how good that that, that vaccine is, even uh, several weeks uh, beginning after the, the, the first dose. What it's also telling us is that if that efficacy is so high, um, three to four weeks later, and in fact, there's emerging evidence to show that even beyond that and, you know, into that 40 day, 42 day zone, then it's very unlikely that, that it, it's going to drop off, you know, the next weeks. And sometimes these vaccines uh, can um, actually increase. You see an increasing vaccine effectiveness um, as the interval increases as well. So that kind of data uh, is being reviewed. These, uh, the investigators, the public health experts who generated those data is presenting to, are presenting to the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, which is the committee that looks at our recommendations. So I think that as that data evolves, um, I think first of all, Canadians uh, should be reassured that if you didn't get your first dose till a little bit later, that is, is unlikely that has an impact. It is not a recommendation to have a one-dose schedule. It is still a two-dose schedule, but looking at how far you can stretch that interval. And why that is important is you can cover more people, of course, with the first dose if you can stretch that interval. So that's a very live um, discussion right now, and the analysis is going on. But it is incredible, I think, that we have such an efficacious tool, and we just need to sort of hunker down to get the vaccines implemented and people to roll up their sleeves when the time comes. So thank you.